All right, are we all ready? Yeah. All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Claire Ballantyne. I'm a, a board member for the Duke Chronicle. Um, I served as editor-in-chief during the 2016-2017 um, year, and I'm now a member of the board of directors. Um, we are very excited to welcome you all to our second fall Chronicle alumni event. Um, it's been really exciting to watch what the Chronicle kids have done this year. They've had a really um, intense year, lots of news going on, especially with the pandemic and the election. We're super proud of them. Um, we're really excited to welcome everyone today and um, definitely want to use this as an opportunity as well to um, say that the Chronicle students have been doing so well and that you know we appreciate your support for um, logging in tonight and also, you know, be sure to check out their work and, and donate on the website if you're, if you're able to. Um, and now I'll turn it over to um, Chrissy, who's our general manager. Hi, everybody. I'm Chrissy Beck and I'm the general manager here at the Chronicle. I'm now in my 12th year, so that's pretty incredible and loving it. Um, just a couple quick things so we can get started. If you don't mind staying muted just during the Q&A part of this conversation, that would be wonderful. And at the end, we should have um, hopefully about 10 minutes for questions. And if you wanna unmute yourself then, that would be fine. If you wanna drop a question in the chat, that's fine too, and I'll be happy to ask it. Um, whatever's easiest for you. It's a smallish group, so we can be um, a little bit more casual. And the good thing is we're gonna give away five of Say Words books at the end of the conversation today. So if you wanna just pop your name in the chat, um, I've got your email address already because you registered for this event and I can get in touch with you that way at the end and find a good mailing address. So if you would like a copy of the book, let me know and between Emma and I, we'll do a drawing at the end and pick out the five folks that get to have a book sent to them. And I think that's it for me for right now. Back to you, Claire. All right. Um, well, it's my pleasure to welcome um, Stephanie Pusilides, who's the current senior at Duke and heading up the Chronicle investigations team this year, um, as well as Sewa Darby, who is the former Chronicle editor and current editor at Atavist. Um, it's a digital magazine and a publication for long form journalism. She's also had pieces published in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, Sayward led the Chronicle um, during the lacrosse scandal, uh, did a great job with that, and so we're thrilled to have her. And Stephanie, we'll hand it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Claire. And thanks so much, Sayward, <clears throat> for coming today. We really appreciate it. Um, so I wanted to first start out with how this book project began. And I noticed in the acknowledgements of your book that you had pitched a story on women and the alt-right in January, 2017, and that you started interviewing sources. And actually two of the three women you focus on in your book were some of those first interviews that you had. Um, so I was curious how you came up with the pitch um, and how did you find these women to interview and why you stuck with the three women um, throughout the book? Yeah, um, well, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm enjoying like toggling on my screen and seeing familiar names um, and unfamiliar faces too. It's very nice to, to see everybody. Um, so yeah, I started working on this story immediately after the election in 2016. Um, I think like a lot of people, I was trying to make sense of things and also figure out how as a journalist, as opposed to, you know, a lawyer or, um, an activist, a community organizer, um, I could contribute to the moment and have something productive to say and, and do. Um, and I was also, I, I left my job around the same time. And so I was sort of in between um, editing jobs and I knew that I wanted a freelance assignment that was gonna be really meaty. Um, that's something I could really sink my teeth into um, that felt timely. And honestly, the topic came about from a very simple like question, which was I was reading a lot of the coverage of the of the alt right at the time. Um, and especially immediately after the election, if you remember, there was that conference in DC where Richard Spencer um, instigated a, a Nazi salute uh, in the room. And I was struck by how in reading so much about this ascendant movement, 
women were never quoted, women were never mentioned. And of course, it's a highly misogynistic movement. But at the same time, I thought that was odd. I was like, well, there must be women somewhere. So I just started looking for women um, online and they were there. Um, and I think the media was really overlooking them because they didn't fit into the neat narrative of angry white men um, who supported Trump. And uh, so when I, when I came up with the story uh, or the pitch, um, which you asked about, I had already done a lot of research. So I, by that, I mean, I had watched a lot of YouTube videos and read a lot of blogs and sort of started to immerse myself in the right wing um, internet sphere. Um, it's kind of its own world. It's like going through the looking glass, honestly, between like what we would consider normal media online and their, and their space. Um, and so I pitched it very much along the lines of what I just said, you know, the media is overlooking women um, in this space. And I want to explain how they fit into this space and what roles they play um, and how they justify uh, being there. And so um, I had a really wonderful editor at Harper's and Katya Bochco, uh, who was such a great guide in this project, because I think with these types of stories involving people very much on the fringe and people who can be hostile um, to media, especially. Um, sh you, you can choose to go undercover. You can choose to take a more like combative approach um, as well. And we kind of went through the different options of, of what made the most sense. And we settled on something that was fundamentally anthropological. Um, the point was to gather as much information as I could to keep people talking um, and then lay out, you know, everything on the page that I had found, but also to be very forthright with them about who I was. Um, so when I started reaching out to these women based on, you know, where I'd found them online, uh, I said, I am, I am a liberal, I consider myself a feminist, like, I do not agree with your worldview, but I also recognize that your worldview is having an impact and I want to understand um, you know, why, why you believe what you believe. And so I got plenty of no's <laughs> in response to, to those inquiries, but then I got some yeses and then some of those yeses led to other connections. Um, and, and the piece that I ultimately wrote for Harper's, which came out in September, well, August online, um, September in print of 2017, uh, that coincided right with what happened in Charlottesville. And so there was also this like surge of interest around um, the far right. I think it, interest had cooled a little bit in early 2017 and then that happened and suddenly it was back you know, on everybody's radar. And so when the piece came out, actually another Chronicle alum, um, who's also a longtime friend of mine named Adam Eaglin, he was a year younger than I, um, or he is a year younger than I, he was a year behind me at, at Duke. He is a literary agent and he suggested that I expand it into a book um, and the book, takes, for those who have read it, I'm sorry to be repeating things, but it takes a, a much more um, historical view. It's not just about the alt-right. In fact, one of the three women who I ultimately profile was in the movement before the alt-right even existed as a, as a, as a label, more or less, because that's what it is. Um, and so the, the book endeavors to explain will examine and explain the role that women have played over the last 150 years, essentially since the Civil War, in perpetuating um, white supremacy, white nationalism, um, through a social movement, not just through you know thinking and um, and believing, but actually through activism. Um, and uh, and I, I ended up sticking with two of the women from my initial article in no small part because they represented themes I was really interested in. Um, they, one of them was, she's a disinformation artist. Like she um, was into conspiracy theories writ large before she was even into white nationalism. Um, and white nationalism is very much a conspiracy theory. Um, and she's very savvy on the internet and she has quite the, the following. And uh, she and her husband have built like a whole business around, uh, around what they do and what they believe. And I was very interested in that sort of vertical, if you will, of you know how disinformation, uh, how people come to believe disinformation, why it's so hard for them to believe the truth, and then also you know how they uh, they can propagate that information and profit from it ultimately. Um, and then another uh, woman in the book who was also in the magazine story, um, she represents. Uh, some other facets of the movement or themes of the movement, I should say. Um, she considers herself highly traditional. So 
uh, you know, traditional dress, traditional gender roles. Um, she is very Christian, although she used not to be. Um, and, you know, just very much this kind of American apple pie idea of being a wife and a mother, um, but that being a vital role uh, that women should be playing in perpetuating the white race. Um, and so trad life is what she calls it, what people in the space call it. And um, she really embodied that. And I was really interested to use her as a lens to look at the obsession with traditional gender roles, the obsession with, um, in some parts of the movement with religion. Um, and then the, the third person um, is someone who had come into the movement and then left the movement. And I was very interested in that arc of how somebody radicalizes and then ultimately de-radicalizes um, because I think that's a underexplored idea when it comes to uh, white nationalism. Although I'm sorry, by the way, my dog is gonna be coming up and down the stairs behind me. <laughs> Just FYI, if you're wondering what that creature is. <laughs> yeah, he's um, a creature on my end, it's my cat. Okay. <laughs> I feel like this is just Zoom life these days. Um, anyway, that's a very long-winded answer. So I'll let you ask <laughs> another question. Yeah, that's really insightful. And I think what you're pointing at is there are a lot of different characteristics between just these two women that are kind of different, but obviously they're still following the same movement and the same ideals of white supremacy. So I was curious, um, were all the women that you interviewed for the book cishet white women? And were there any varying demographics of those people, such as like education levels, you mentioned religion, maybe socioeconomic status. Yeah, there's a wonderful quote, not wonderful, it, because I, I say this every time I talk about this quote, I don't mean wonderful as in like, isn't that great, but more that it's just a really succinct, like great way of describing um, the fact of, of the right wing. Um, in the 1990s, this sociologist was being interviewed about her research for the New York Times, and they asked her, you know, is there a type who gets involved in this movement? And her response was, that would be comforting. Um, and I think that that's like really stuck with me because there really isn't, I think we, we so badly want to be able to delineate and say, oh, you know, this person is, you know, exactly the kind of person who would get into this space. Um, and it's not that simple. Uh, yes, there are certain factors, I guess, that make people vulnerable, um, but they're very, they're very uh, amoebic, for lack of a better way of putting it. It's not like, oh, if you make less than, you know, $50,000 a year, you're suddenly more vulnerable. Or if you live in this one part of the country or, um, you know, any, any number of things. In fact, people who are involved in the space cross the spectrum. So they're from all sorts of different um, class backgrounds, um, educational backgrounds, family, religious, like, absolutely everything. And so one of the things that was really interesting in working on the book was talking to people who came from very different situations and circumstances and trying to find what was common in the way that they talked about their experiences. Um, you know, were they in particularly uh, sort of vulnerable moments in their lives when they, uh, you know, decided that this was the way and the truth and the light for them. Uh, and, and you know, I, I try my best in the book to, to kind of describe what those, what those factors might be. But the bottom line is that they are far more um, amorphous than I think we would like to imagine. And frankly, one of the things that I think the media has done um, a not great job with is pushing this idea that, you know, it's all white, dudes in like their mom's basements or whatever, you know? And there are a lot of those to be clear. <laughs> um, but that overlooks, you know, a whole swath of people. Um, and I was even, I was asked recently uh, to comment on um, in the, in advance of the election, if there are women whose, you know, boyfriends, husbands, brothers, sons, fathers, um, you know, they're, they're worried about them committing violence, you know, who should they report that to? Um, you know, how, how can we help them? And I was like, well, I mean, anybody in anybody's orbit who's worried about somebody committing violence should report it. But I think it's a misjudgment of the situation to assume that women are always going to be like the better angels in those situations, because they're often, um, you know, people who are really helping coordinate, uh, you know, cells of these, um, of, you know, different parts of the movement. Um, sometimes they're very active in them. Um, and that was another thing I found quite interesting in, in talking to people was hearing 
you know, some women had done certain things and felt, you know, great about their roles. And then other women had done very different types of things in the movement um, and felt great about that. And so they're not all women who just stay at home and, you know, cook their husband's dinner and tell them congratulations for, you know, that clan meeting they just went to or anything like that. Um, they're, they're much savvier than that. Yeah. And when you're going into this reporting, you said that you acknowledged that you had a different worldview than them. You were a progressive, you're a feminist, but you're also a white woman, which is in similarity to them. So how did you acknowledge that in your reporting and did that influence at, at all your writing? Yeah, I mean, that was something I was very honest with them about. I mean, they could have looked it up if they wanted to. Um, and plenty of them did, you know, their research on me, just like I did their my research on them. Um, but I do think that in terms of how this, you know, why did I choose this project in the first place and how, um, you know, the fact of who I am, like, how did that affect um, how I approach the actual writing? This really felt like in my lane. Um, and I think that there's so much good reporting and, um, you know, philosophy and uh, sociology and history and so much important work being done about anti-racism and the experiences of communities of color, um, immigrant communities, uh, all sorts of, you know, different people who are affected by white supremacy. Um, but, you know, I as a white woman had unique access to have conversations um, with other white women. Like, I, I don't know that if I had been a black man, they would have even responded to my emails. And so this kind of gets back to this question of like, why did I even look into this in the first place? And it felt like something where I really could at least try to have a value add um, in, in the wider like discourse surrounding um, white supremacy in the Trump era. Yeah, and you, you mentioned this work of many researchers on anti-racism, on racism, white supremacy, such as social scientists and historians. And I noticed you even mentioned some um, Duke professors, like mm -hmm. formerly Claudia Coons and then yeah. Ashley Jardina, who's currently at Duke. And I was curious if, you know, there's research going on that you cite as you've started this project in 2017 until publication. Um, so what was your process in researching this academically and then also simultaneously doing this reporting and did any research come out that furthered your writing and just what was that process like? Yeah, no, that's such a great question. I mean, I feel like, uh, in terms of, you know, how I did the, the, uh, historical or um, academic research is the word I'm looking for. Sorry, guys, it's been a long day. Um, the the academic research, um, I mean, in that case, just having had a good education was really helpful. Um, you know, I uh, did a ton of research at Duke. Um, I went to grad school, did a ton of research in grad school. I'm very comfortable with like navigating um, the academic space, even though I'm not an academic. Um, and if anything, it was really important to me to make sure that I covered that space because I think too often in journalism, there's this disconnect between expertise and reporting. Um, like maybe you call one person to get a quote, but you don't necessarily like read everything that they've written. And certainly in working on a book, it felt like it was incumbent upon me to, to make sure I was reading everything. Um, and so uh, there were, my, my computer is just like full of files <laughs> where, you know, I saved everything and, and tagged them and coded it and um, to keep to keep track of all of the, the research that I was reading. Um, and it turns out that, yes, there was a lot to read, but relative to other subjects, there was not a lot to read because it's not a subject that people have given a lot of. And I'm, I'm talking about sort of right wing um, activism and ideology, generally speaking, it's not something that people have invested in and thought a lot about um, in the academy. I actually talked to this one professor, um, she's a history professor at Chicago, and she wrote a really well-received book um, two years ago called Bring the War Home, which is about um, the paramilitary white supremacist movement in the 1980s. And I actually, pre-pandemic times, I went to a book signing and, and chatted with her and then spoke to her on the phone and, and over email several times. And she told me that when she was working on her PhD, which was the basis for this book she ultimately wrote, people kind of looked at her sideways, like, why are you bothering to, like, this can't possibly be valuable. Um, you know, these people are just crazy. These people, you know, whatever, any, any number of things. And then of course she has for, for an academic, an incredibly well-received like mainstream book because it happened to be published at exactly the time that uh, you know the wider 
populace is interested in it. So um, that gets to your point about, you know, ongoing research. Um, I think there's a lot of research happening right now that we will see, and, th and there've been some important like studies that have come out. Um, I think there will be some coming out just in the next couple of months. Um, and so I was lucky enough to, in some cases, talk to people along the way who were mid processed. Um, you know, we're just starting to ask a question. Um, and it was interesting to hear how they were approaching that question. Um, but Claudia Kuntz wrote like the ultimate book. Um, it's called, uh, mothers of the in the fatherland um it's real big it's so good um and it's about women in the third reich um and there have been basically two really great books on that subject and hers is one of them um and it was tremendously helpful and then ashley jardina i actually said on twitter the other day to her that she's a prophet because <laughs> because like her decision she studies white identity as um as you know a, a, a thing that informs how people vote how people move through like a political or an economic system. Um, and that's not something actually that people have studied very closely over time because white identity was considered the default for so long. Um, why would you study the thing that was the norm? Um, and uh, and her research has been enormously, I mean, I know I'm not the only one to say this, that her, her research is really forward looking um, in a way that is, is exciting. And I'm sure she's gonna keep, you know, producing really important stuff um, in the coming years. For sure. Um, and I had a more general question about your writing process. Um, how did your writing at all change over time? Did the narrative of the book alter or what was what was that like? Taking a drink before I talk about structure. Um, yeah, no, figuring out the structure of the book was by far the hardest part. Um, there are some books, some of my favorite nonfiction books are just great stories, right? Like um, The Looming Tower, I mean, what an incredible story or like any David Grand book on Killers of the Flower Moon or Lost City of Z. Like there are just some books that the story is there and it's just, you know, somebody needs to do all the research, do all the reporting and tell that story. This book was not that. There was not this like central captivating narrative. It was a book about people and a book about ideas. Um, it was a book about, you know, the last 150 years, but it also needed to not be a tome. And so figuring out how to put all of those things together and make it readable was really hard. And in working on the proposal for the book, it was something that my agent and I agonized over. And then we finally kind of came up with what we thought was a good structure and then, you know, sold the book, amazing. And then I very quickly realized it was actually not the right structure. Like as I got deeper and deeper into the reporting and research, I was like, this just isn't going to, to work. And um, so at one point, um, I came up with an idea that I thought I was like, I think I'm just gonna tell it like in three parts. I'm gonna focus on the women and then figure out, you know, in each of their stories, um, how to tell a complete story, I feel like there's a beginning, middle, and end, but then also, you know, explore different thematic pieces in their stories. Um, but that all sounds fine in your head. And then I started, I was at a writer's residency um, for a couple of weeks and I had a bulletin board in the studio that they gave me. And I, I looked like I was trying to solve like a serial killing situation. Cause it was like post-it notes and ripped up pages and like scribblings that would make no sense to anybody but me. And I would move things around, um, but it was really, <laughs> it was really helpful. Um, and then, uh, you know, I like, asked my editor, would it be okay if I did a different structure and described what I was thinking? And she said, great. And then I actually had this very funny validating experience right before I turned in my manuscript when I was still like, I don't know if this can work. I happened to pick up a book. It's a really great book called Savage Appetites. Um, and it's about um, our obsession with true crime and specifically why women are obsessed with true crime. And it's by this wonderful uh, journalist named Rachel Monroe. And she does the same thing. It's divided into four parts, each of which focuses on a specific woman and it uses their story to explore themes. And, um, and I was like, oh, it can work. <laughs> um, and so that was really, really helpful um, in feeling like, okay, there's a compare, you know, a comparable book out right now um, that, that feels like, like mine. Um, and yet like somebody, one person reviewed it and said that they feel like it, it reads like Legos dumped on the floor. Like, I'm not sure how to piece these together. So, um, so I mean, I like the structure, but, uh, but it was really hard um, to, come, to come to it. And it was certainly a huge learning curve as a writer. Um, you know, I, the Atavist, I should say, 
We run stories that are at minimum eight to 10,000 words. Um, and at most, I worked on something that was like 25 to 30. Um, and so I'm lucky enough that I am dealing with big projects lengthwise and depth wise in a way that, you know, not every journalist is on a regular basis. And so that was certainly helpful in working on the book. Um, but at the same time, 25,000 words is not 90,000 words. Um, and so, you know, I read a lot of other books and talked to a lot of other friends who had written books and, you know, got advice about how they approached structure um, and how they approached, you know, making sure that the whole thing hangs together. Um, and then I had some really helpful readers once the once the manuscript was was done, my husband included, um, who's upstairs right now, but um, a, a couple of friends who who also were in publishing who read it uh, and let me know what was working and what was not. Great. Yeah. And one of the one of the people that you focus on in the book, Corinna Olson, I had a specific question about the takeaway from her story. Um, and just, you know, kind of reiterating what you've, what you wrote about, um, her story shows how someone who is deeply um, immersed in white supremacy um, can really disavow it. And you explain that Corinna specifically turned away from white supremacy and white nationalism because it no longer provided her what it had promised, which you describe as meaning and camaraderie. Um, so from your reporting, what do you believe it would take for white women in white supremacy to challenge it? Yeah, um, this is, I was actually just talking to my husband about this on the way home today because uh, fr from voting was where we were. Um, so you guys know what my day was like, um, walking home from the polls because one of the subjects in my book, not Karina, but Lana um, uh, just put her house on the market in Virginia. And I started getting all these like pings from her neighbors who were like my little Harriet, the spy <laughs> friends down there. They're wonderful, I love them so much. Um, but. Uh, they were like, the house is on the market, house is on the market. And one of them sent me a really nice email. She had finished my book. Um, she's um, elderly. And she said, you know, I can't say I'm not unhappy that they're moving, but I also do wish that we had, you know, been able to forge some kind of connection that maybe would have cha changed their minds or, you know, at least shifted the way they think about the world in some way. And I told my husband that, and we both kind of shook our heads and we were like, I, that's just not how it works most of the time. Um, you wish that you could, you know, talk to somebody, show them the reasons that, you know, what they, what they believe or the way they're moving through the world is, is problematic um, and um, harmful to people, uh, but it doesn't usually happen. Um, it's not like people say, oh, you're right. I'd never thought of it that way. Um, fundamentally what has to change for them is the incentive whatever it is that and again um, as you say for Karina you know it was community and meaning and for other people it can be power it can be money it can be um, you know just an, a narrative that positions themselves in the world in a way that they can cope with um, that has to change for them um, and so I've described the process of radicalization and de-radicalization a few times as like selfish and I think it really is because it's going to be super individualized to the person, um, which isn't to say that there are not, you know, ways to approach the possibility of de-radicalization in a more um, systematic way. And there's actually a group called Life After Hate that does this. It's, all, it's run by people who they're called formers. Um, so all people who used to be in the movement and they you can reach out if you're someone who is in the space and wants to leave, but isn't sure how, um, and they have, you know, a, a whole operation that, that helps with that. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, yeah, incentives have to change for people. And that's so hard to do in a, um, in a kind of, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for? in a way that could become entrenched widely. You know, like what's gonna change Lana's mind, the woman who's moving is not gonna be the same thing that changed Karina's mind, is not gonna be the same thing that changed other former's minds that I spoke to. Um, and I think that that really points to the fact that it's very important to understand radicalization and de-radicalization, but more importantly, it's about changing the overall conditions in which we as a society function, the way we talk about race, the way we talk about racism, um, the way we talk about whiteness, um, and, you know, really thinking of it from a healthcare perspective as preventative medicine, as opposed to treatment of a problem, um, because treating the problem is absolutely vital, but it's also not going to eliminate the problem. Um, the problem is going to keep 
you know, festering. So um, I always feel like I'm a bit of a downer when I talk about talk about de-radicalization um, because I do think it's fascinating and, and important, but it's also not something that's clear cut um, in terms of in terms of you know what advice could you give to an individual? It's like well, I would really have to know who that individual was. I would have to know their circumstances and their story to even you know begin to have a good answer for that. Yeah. And what was it like to be so immersed in this world? And was it difficult to unplug from it or did it impact you emotionally? Yeah, it was definitely um, a challenge. Um, I, yeah, I mean, it's not pleasant to get up every day and see what's up on Stormfront, um, which is the oldest uh, hate site in in America or the world um, and then be like I'm gonna see what the Nazis are up to on Twitter <laughs> and then I'm gonna shift over to YouTube and you know like that's not a totally pleasant way to spend your day um, I think a couple of things were helpful for me first of all was the feeling that what I was researching mattered um, and you know I would close my computer be really horrified by something I'd seen or heard and be like but you know what like keep going because like you're getting closer to being able to articulate what you want to articulate about this. Um, and so it's kind of like that itch you have to keep scratching. Um, and then um, I was not able to take any sort of book leave from my job um, for complicated reasons. Um, but I actually think that that worked in my favor because I had something else in my life work-wise, writing and editing-wise, that was that had nothing to do with any of this. And so as an editor, um, working at The Atavist, we publish one story a month. It's very, like, we have long lead time. I work very closely with writers. These are passion projects for them. And there was something very, like, rewarding and grounding about that being very much part of my routine at the same time that I was working on, um, working on this book. Um, and then I also took up yoga in the middle of working on the book and that was really helpful. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it was e even now, you know, I, um, in reading about the news, you know, whatever, I don't know, the latest thing Trump said, I can go into my social media feeds and read what people at the New York times are saying and people on Gab are saying, which is like, they're, um, the rights, like Twitter equivalent. Um, and it's a very weird through the looking glass thing of realizing that there are two completely opposite ways of seeing um, the news. Yeah, what would, um, I'm curious of how the work was received as far as like possibly giving a platform or shining light on the hate movement. I know you talked about that you really wanted to provide insight into what this is like for white women to support white supremacy and really, you know, bring the truth to their perspective, but also, you know, how can we de-radicalize is so important to understand how that process could go. Yeah, this is such an important debate that has been going on in the media now for several years about how to cover these people. And I think that initially, so 2016 period, and even actually in like the 2014 to 2015 period too, there was some interesting coverage of these burgeoning um, movements, whether you're talking about like the men's rights movement or the alt-right. And I think that there was a initially dismissive way that the media wrote about them, um, where it was almost mocking. I mean, sometimes it was outright mocking, mocking, excuse me. But I think that what they were doing was shining a light on it. They weren't actually engaging with the ideas and saying, you know, not that you can deal with every single fact that is not a fact that they throw out, but at least, you know, doing a good job of saying like, this is wrong. Not only is it wrong, like what are the forces that are making people think that it's not wrong? Like they they were much more just kind of, you know, looking at individuals and saying like, isn't this guy crazy or isn't this never a woman, but isn't, isn't this guy crazy? Um, and then I think um, immediately after Trump's election, people were like, oh my God, like, there are so many Nazis in the country <laughs> and they were really freaking out. And so they started writing these stories that were quick hits. Like, you know, there was this famous one in the New York times that was more or less like the Nazi next door. That's an important story to tell because I think it's very important to know that these are not people like, you know, I don't know, living on, I mean, some of them live in compounds, sure. But like that oftentimes they are just people who live next door. Um, like my the people in Virginia who uh, <laughs> found a Nazi living next door to them and then started texting me frantically about it a few years ago. Um, 
but the but the story was not told in a way it, it was just a little bit too I don't know like ogling ogling I, I never know how to pronounce that word but like almost kind of treating it as like I don't know something to be like gawked at and um and that to me was problematic because that was kind of like the tenor of coverage immediately and you, there was a ton of pushback against that for good reason. But then that also meant some of that pushback kind of coalesced into this idea that we shouldn't be covering them at all. We should just not be giving them oxygen because if we don't give them oxygen, then their ideas, you know, can't breathe basically. Um, the problem with that is that they don't need my oxygen or anybody's oxygen. They have so much oxygen because the internet is the wild west. It's insane. And if you, you know, don't write about them, in the mainstream and like treat them as a serious threat and like engage with their ideas and show why their ideas are wrong, they're still going to be selling those ideas um, to people uh, across the internet on you know every every platform you can think of. And there's a quote in the um, conclusion of the book that I think about all the time that was just a random YouTube user commenting on a video that one of the women in, in the book um, posted that was about like, never talk to the media. Um, this was somewhere she had decided that like I was the great enemy and uh, and was telling her followers not to trust me. Um, and um, and a commenter said, we don't need the media. We're our own media now. And so I think that um, that's so true. Um, but that also means that it's so important for journalists, good journalists, <laughs> to treat this topic as something that should be covered that should be treated with like a lot of care and a lot of nuance. Um, and, you know, having good readers and good editors and good fact checkers and other people who can comb through things and make sure that you're not giving them oxygen in, you know, an unfair way. It was interesting to me when we started to promote the book because there was a good bit of interest surrounding it from, you know, people who wanted to do interviews and um, like, I don't know, Q&A type things. Um, but TV was particularly shy about it. Um, and I think that that was because they didn't feel like in you know a two minute segment, they could get across everything that they wanted to get across and they were worried about being seen as promoting the agenda, um, which is fine so far as it goes, but it also I think points to a need to, I don't know, have better, literacy about these issues within the media um, and to be able to to talk about them um, more knowledgeably um, and not just assume that you know I don't know a two minute segment is going to to be the kind of thing that puts people put, puts your brand at risk but then also you know poses a risk radicalization wise so um, I feel like I'm not totally making sense but I think the bottom line of this is like should be covered um, but should be covered by people for whom this is a beat, um, who are thinking about this all the time, not just somebody who like pops into Ohio to talk about the Nazi next door. Um, and also, you know, making sure that you never let something stand as a fact, an idea, whatever, um, that, that is not true. Um, and I thought about this a lot in working on the book because in interviews, I had this packed with myself that I wasn't going to argue with them because I knew that arguing was pointless. It wasn't like I was going to change their mind. And also they wanted me to argue with them because they're bad faith actors and they come to the table with different, you know, terms of the debate, frankly. Um, and I wasn't going to agree to those terms. I just wanted to keep them talking. But I also kept telling myself, like, you can put your disagreement, you can put your analysis and your disagreement in the writing. Um, and I think that that's a really important thing um the, the best journalists covering this space think about that a lot um you know how can i can I, how can i bring research and i mean common sense frankly to bear in the writing um while also getting the most i can from you know whatever my source is yeah that's really interesting and i think with current coverage of the election um i've been particularly interested in how they've been covering the white women vote specifically um, and like you mentioned in your book, um, white women have historically voted for Republican candidates um, in the presidential election. And in context of, you know, President Trump up for re-election, and he usually touts, you know, women, he says that women vote for him and that they have voted for him in the past 
general election, but in reality, that is only white women, but he doesn't really, you know, specify that in his statements and he repeatedly right. makes that type of a statement. Um, so I was curious what you think in context of your research on white women and some um, reporting has showed that white women in states like Pennsylvania and other swing states might actually be going in favor of Biden. So do you think there could possibly be some sort of a shift in white women vote specifically because of Trump? Um, does your research indicate anything in that? Yeah, um, no, God, such a, this is like, I don't know, the topic du jour. Um, I feel as we, I mean, there are lots of topics du jour. It's 2020. It seems like there's a new topic every 10 minutes, but um, but no, this is such an important question, particularly in swing states. And I think the thing to remember is that not every white woman who voted for Trump, and I think when they, they you know, the numbers ultimately came in, it was something like 49%. It was a plurality, not initially, they thought it was like 53, but it was a little bit lower. Anyway, still a lot. Um, those were not all white nationalists. The white nationalists are a lock for Trump. Like if any, if, if for whatever reason, and some of them do not think he's conservative enough, like they're just not gonna vote or they're gonna, I don't know, write in Hitler or something. But um, but then there's this whole group of people, you know, who are not over there, but aren't so far from there, even though they might think they're not so far from there. And so maybe there's something that they find very objectionable about Trump um, and they're not gonna vote for him this time. But one of the things I'm actually really scared about, I'm scared about so many things, but um, one of the things I'm really scared about is that things are going to go okay, um, that he's going to ultimately no longer be in office, hopefully be in prison, um, and that people will be like, okay, we won, good job, everybody, like defeated this, you know, white supremacy, um, because we as Americans like solutions like that. We like thinking that, you know, big gestures from a democratic perspective mean that a problem is gone. Um, and the bottom line is that if somebody voted for Trump in 2016, knowing everything they knew about him and didn't vote for, don't vote for him in 2020, that does not mean necessarily that they're not people who are, that they, they wouldn't vote for another Trump, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and one of the things in my book that, um, and this kind of gets back to the, to the platforming question, um, you know, or uh, I should say not platforming, sorry, but like, you know, uh, covering the subject and, and shining a light on it is this idea that this subject is somehow other, that this is like, I don't know, on another planet. It's so weird. Um, like these are, you know, this weird fringe group that, uh, or movement that supports Trump. And that's not true. A lot of what they say and a lot of what they believe is not that different than what people who would consider themselves in the mainstream believe. Maybe they articulate it differently. Maybe they're like, I hate PC culture. I'm just going to use slurs or, you know, maybe they've just read a lot about Hitler and really, you know, want him to be reevaluated um, in the historical consciousness or whatever. But at the end of the day, if you were to actually look at what they believe policy wise, it's not so different from potentially this like category of voters who might flip. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, whatever they find gross about Trump or whatever, um, they, you know, that they wouldn't, the next time somebody comes up and is race baiting and fear mongering and, you know, lying about people who are not white, um, that they wouldn't give that person a shot in the White House. Um, so, I don't know. Um, I feel like I'm like all doom and despair here, but I, I certainly want people to vote against Trump. Um, uh, but I also want us as a community, as a society to not assume that that, that signals some kind of permanent shift. Um, because I think this is, this is like an issue that you have to keep attending to and keep pushing and keep demanding better. For sure. And I think my final question might be on a more lighter note. Um, so what do you hope that people take away from your book? Um, I think I hope that what I just said is actually one of the most like important things for me is this idea that, um, white nationalism is something that's not familiar. Um, I think there's this idea that they, you know, they're either all angry white dudes in their mom's basement or they all wear hoods or they all have swastika tattoos and plenty of them do those things, but then there are plenty who don't. Um, and they have YouTube channels and they have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of followers. Um, people, 
you know, their, their followers go to them first before they go to actual news sources. Um, and they're people who have good degrees, sometimes higher, you know, master's degrees, things like that. These are not PhDs in some cases, like these are not people who are on, you know, some sort of societal fringe by any other standard. Um, and so I think it's really important to see ourselves in this space and say like, what about my beliefs? What about my experience might actually, you know, I don't know, be reflected there. What does that say about me? What does that say about my, I don't know, the world that I have created for myself? Um, how can I deal with that? Um, and so I describe it in the intro to the book as the funhouse mirror. And I think being willing to like look in the funhouse mirror and see what is familiar but distorted is so important. Um, I also, I also hope that people read it and become aware of the kind of rhetoric and tendencies that might signal someone close to them getting caught up in this world. Um, you know, what kinds of YouTube channels are they watching? Um, you know, how are they speaking about certain issues? Um, and I don't know, feeling like you have tools to respond to that, um, before somebody goes whole hog into it. Um, yeah, I would say that I hope people enjoy reading it, but it's a really weird book to say that I hope you enjoy reading it. <laughs> um, uh, I hope the prose is fine, <laughs> um, that you find it agreeable. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Yeah. I feel like there are probably some questions over here. Oh, hi, 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 hi. Lots of highs. Yeah. Hi, guys. This is Chrissy. I. Um, Sherry, it looks like you had a question. Do you want to ask it? Or would you like me to do that for you? I'm happy to. Hi there. I'm unmuted. Uh, I was wondering, first of all, just fantastic. And I think your ideas about the emotional drivers of community and status in one sense or another, uh, I think these are very key ideas. Um, so my question was, how do you feel that Amy Coney Barrett fits into this worldview? And what is the function of women leadership uh, like her within a world in which women are supposed to be in a traditional sphere within that ideology? Thanks right. Yeah, no, thank you so much um, for those kind words. And um, I've had so many thoughts since the Amy Coney Barrett stuff happens. <laughs> Most of them very freaked out. Um, I think that, you know, I would not call her a white nationalist. I don't know Amy Coney Barrett. Um, I disagree with her on pretty much, I think, 100% of, of issues. But what I find fascinating about not just her, but the way that the Republican Party positioned her is super, super similar to the way that a lot of women are positioned in white nationalism. So um, a great example of this is, uh, and this is a foreign example, but still very relevant. And Claudia Kuntz actually talks about this extensively in her book, Mothers in the Fatherland. There was a woman who was like the head of the women's wing of the Nazi party. Um, her name was Gertrude Schultz Klink. And um, she led a, a huge organization um, of women for whom being wives, being mothers was, those were both political choices, political acts. They were seen as, um, you know, in, ensuring the future of Aryan peoples in Germany. Um, she was a mother of, I want to say seven, maybe nine, a lot of kids. Um, and like when Hitler talked about her, he talked about what a wonderful mother she was. And there's no way that she would have been given the rank that she was given if she was not also inhabiting, embodying um, this kind of idealized version of motherhood and womanhood. Um, and so I was thinking a lot about that in watching um, Amy Coney Barrett and the way that people talked about her and talked about her motherhood. Um, she, she's supposed to be unthreatening. She's supposed to be just a nice wife and a nice mom who happens to be really accomplished and look how she has it all and she juggles everything. Um, how bad can she be? Um, and her ideas are scary and her ideas are scary for women. Like that's what's so crazy to me. She's the kind of woman who the modern right and white nationalists always have put on a pedestal and said, this is the ideal. 
Um, and, you know, of course, not every woman is going to be a law professor and on a Supreme Court, but if they are, it's going to be somebody like this. Um, and never mind that, you know, her policies might be disenfranchising to any number of other mothers who don't fit that mold, whether they're not white, whether they're single, whether they're gay, like any number of things. So it's it's weird because I don't think she fits into the space like as an individual, because again, I just don't I don't know her and I couldn't say. <laughs> but I think that the symbolism um, that they have really used with her, that is straight out of a really terrifying playbook that we've seen time and time again. So um, yeah, I've been very freaked out. I think we have time for one more if you guys are okay. Allison, do you want to ask a question? Sure. Thanks for um, chatting with us. This has been uh, wonderful to hear, even if the subject matter is not. Um, I've been in the tech industry for many years. What do you, and, and clearly there's been a lot of talk, you know, talk. Some people get deplatformed and go to Gab and all the other mm -hmm. alternate alternate sites. What responsibility, and YouTube is, is clearly a, a driver of a lot of this you know, um, community of radicalization. What do you feel like the, the big tech companies should be doing that they're not doing to rein this in, get their hands around it? Um, and or what, what should people be doing to make it not acceptable that that's still out there? Yeah, no, oh man. Um, it's interesting, my, I could talk about this all day. Um, I, I work, so the magazine I work for is owned by WordPress. Okay. Like less of a, it's, it's weird. Cause I'm like technically a WordPress employee, but I don't do anything at WordPress that like has anything to do with the actual company. They just bought us a few years ago because I don't know, tech does these things. Um, but it's been interesting to kind of be, you know, a little bit closer to the action, so to speak about things like whose blog should we take down because of hate speech? I'm not privy to those conversations, but I do just become aware, like when something has been taken down. And, um, a few months ago, uh, or a year ago, I guess now, WordPress acquired Tumblr. And I actually did like a brown bag lunch on Zoom with um, the Tumblr terms of service team talking to them about these issues. And I do not envy the people who work on those teams whose job it is to look at content and say, like, what do we do about this? Because some content is really obvious. Other content is not so obvious. And the people making it know that. They're morphing constantly to be like, okay, well, that language is apparently no good anymore. So let's move to this other dog whistle or let's come up with an entirely new vocabulary. I mean, that was one of the things that was really important and interesting about the alt-right was that they came up with a whole, you know, dictionary's worth of words and then sort of like a visual dictionary too um, that made it really hard to know, like, what is this? It's just weird looking, but then it turns out, you know, it's, it's hate speech. Um, and so I think tech companies more than anything, I would just really like to see them stop cowering in the face of criticism from the right. This idea, you know, oh, uh, you know, Facebook treats conservatives so badly and is trying to silence their voices. Meanwhile, like that is not true like <laughs> from any standpoint. And Facebook is also making a lot of money from some of those voices. Um, and I feel like they always overreact and start kowtowing in these moments and saying, oh, no, 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 like we support all viewpoints. And it's like, but no, just say that you don't just say that like some views are morally objectionable and like you're not the government and who cares? Like you get to set your own terms. So this is also why I'm not a business person because my bleeding heart would mean that I never made any money. Um, but to me, more than anything, I would just really like to see big tech take an ethical stand and say, like, what is more important than profits and our reach and our competitiveness is ensuring that facts always rise above lies. We call a lie a lie and that we don't tolerate trolling, hate speech, like any number of things. Um, I feel like they're just always playing catch up and they're like a mile behind. Um, and it's really disheartening to see. Um, so yeah, there's a really good book um, called Antisocial. Yeah, I've read it. <laughs> yeah, um, by Andrew Marantz, um at uh, at the the New Yorker. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because he, if people haven't read it, he takes sort of two approaches. He talks about gatekeepers and gate crashers. So the gatekeepers are the people who, you know, 
have this very idealistic version of, you know, democracy on the internet and, you know, anybody can say whatever they want to say and isn't that so great. Um, but then also like have no idea what the consequences of, of a completely laissez-faire approach are. And then when actually confronted with hate speech and things like that, get just show themselves not um, up to the challenge. And then the gate crashers are the people who are taking advantage of that. Um, and it's definitely worth reading to get a sense of the dynamics um, in play. Definitely. Um, well, I'm going to jump in here. I'm Lindsay Rep. I'm the co-chair of the Chronicle's Board of Directors, um, and I was editor in 2010-2011 of the Chronicle, and I'm very lucky to know Sayward, and I just wanted to take this moment to say thank you so much for taking the time to do this with us, and thank you to everyone who called in to this informative and very important event. I know everyone has like Zoom fatigue, but I think it's so <laughs> nice and meaningful that we can all be together. We're so lucky that we can be able to do this and stay connected even now. Totally, totally. No, thank you so much for having me. And also Lindsay, hi to your cat who looks adorable. She, what's, what's, what's the cat's name? Uh, Zuzu, and she also <laughs> wants to fight white supremacy. So. Hey, smash white supremacy, Zuzu. Take it out. <laughs> Scratch it. Um, I also wanted to say um, that the Chronicle hasn't, you know, been stopped by COVID. The, the staff is working harder than ever. So, you know, we're on the alumni side trying, you know, working to put together these events for you guys. And then the staff is um, working their butts off to cover Duke and, um, and Durham and all the crazy things that are happening. And they're doing really awesome work. Chrissy put the link in the chat. Please, please read their work. Um, and, you know, they actually just got some recognition. Maybe you missed it. They won a pacemaker. That's huge. They were also recognized for a project that they spearheaded that puts together COVID coverage from college newspapers across all 50 states. So make sure you check that out, too. Uh, it's a really cool project, and um, they've worked really hard on it. Um, but, you know, like a lot of organizations, we need your help to keep it going, uh, to keep to keep doing this amazing journalism. and. Um, you know, it's been a really disruptive time for everyone, including a lot of our advertisers uh, and, and for us. And so, you know, if you can, we'd really appreciate um, if you guys could make a donation, be a part of our Chronicle family, even more so than you clearly already are. Sorry about the cat there. <laughs> Um, and you can do that at DukeChronicleAlumni.com and we would really appreciate it. So if you, you know, we know that everyone's situation is different now. So if you can, please consider um, giving. And if you can't, you know, we love you just the same. Um, so, you know, lots of these kids are going to go on to hopefully do great work like Sayward. So please consider supporting them. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much for coming Sayward. You're amazing. And um, Stephanie, good job getting, reading, getting all those questions together. Yeah, that was Stephanie, those were like fantastic questions. They I feel were like really that's a lot of dumb questions. Those were all amazing questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's good to hang out with you guys tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, this felt really empowering. So thank you guys all. And thank you, Sayward. Thank you. Thanks, y'all.